Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to this night's he tonight's hearing. Um, tonight is a development committee hearing on possible changes to our vehicle for higher code. I want to remind everyone first and foremost so that we have the opportunity to hear from everyone that if you are interested in speaking on this topic this evening that you please complete a speaker slip which can be found at the entrance of chambers, complete these speaker slips and submit them to my legislative assistant behind me, Annie Marsico, and we will be accepting speaker slips until 5.30. I want to take time to thank a couple individuals that uh, have been through the changes um, beginning three years ago now with Vehicle for Hire and reviewing necessary changes um, to the code and again, also working hard on the changes that we'll be proposing this evening. Starting with the great leadership of the Director of Public Safety, Mitchell J. Brown, Assistant Director Amanda Ford, Support Services Administrator Ramona Patz. I want to thank them for all their hard work in addition to working with my team, Annie Marsico and Devin Peros on uh, some of these uh, changes. I also want to take time to thank the volunteers who serve on the Vehicle for Hire Board for all of their hard work, their time and energy and feedback related to this process. I cannot thank them enough for volunteering their time and listening not only to me, but to all of the stakeholders who are impacted by the proposed changes that you'll hear about this evening. So I want to also recognize, I believe I, yeah, John Oswald, who is a part of Council Member Klein's office, who's current chair of safety, just to make sure everyone is aware moving forward uh, that uh, Council Member Klein is a chair of public safety. Again, as we have heard before, the background to this issue is not new to many of you who are here in our audience and those who are viewing at home. We have certainly been through a lot in modernizing and updating our vehicle for higher code, and it has certainly been a priority of mine and a priority on behalf of all of our citizens that we make sure we have adequate codes related to transportation in our great city. This past July, uh, while we modernized, uh, modernized all of our vehicle for higher code to reflect today's technology and consumer demands, at the same time, the state was doing their work in passing their biannual budget. And one of the provisions in that budget allowed for livery services to no longer be conducted on an hourly rate. This major change at the state level opened the door for the new industry mobile application-based vehicle for hire to enter into the Ohio market. Following shortly thereafter in December, we began to work to incorporate changes to the vehicle for hire code that would allow liveries to operate on demand through mobile applications. Once council passed the code to allow for liveries to operate in this way, the city began to look into peer-to-peer -peer transportation network services, which will be the core focus of, this night, of tonight's hearing. Looking at the national landscape, we knew that this was going to be one of the next innovations in the vehicle for hire industry to hit Columbus. And so in July, while taking a comprehensive approach to changes in the industry, such as requiring credit card machines for ease of consumers and visitors and all, licensing the pedicabs, offering alternatives to large venues, events, football games, and many others, and increasing insurance for taxi cabs. It is only fair that we allow this new type of service to enter into the market, that we take a a comprehensive approach that maintains fairness across the board in offering transportation alternatives to visitors, our citizens, and the like. Want to make sure I remind everyone, which I think I have done a good job of doing along the way, is that consumer protection and the safety of our public is absolutely the most important element of the changes that are being proposed. Since taking office and consistently during my term, public safety has been my number one priority. This is no different. I want to make sure that passengers are safe, well-informed, making informed decisions when making choices about their own transportation when they entrust their lives to our drivers. With that, I'd like to turn the hearing over to Director Brown, Assistant Director Ford, and Ramona Patz of Support Services to provide a presentation of proposed policy changes to the Vehicle for Hire Code. 
just before uh, Director Brown, I want to remind some of the individuals who've just joined us. I see we've had a significant number of individuals join us. I want to take this time to remind everyone, if you are interested in speaking at tonight's hearing, please complete a speaker slip, which can be found at the entrance of chambers. <coughs> Once completing that slip, please hand it over to Annie Marsico, who's sitting behind me, to make sure that we have your speaker slip at the time of the most important part of tonight's hearing, and that is public testimony. We will accept slips until 5.30. Director Brown. Good evening, Councilmember Mills. And I want to say, I want to echo your comments with regards to my staff and your staff working together along with the vehicle for hire personnel to try and address a very, very complicated but certainly necessary piece of legislation that we're talking about this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to present here this evening the present several initial proposed code changes and the creation of two new code change sections to address changes in the vehicle for hire industry. As you're well aware, technology is constantly changing. It has impacted the way we shop, the way we search for new homes or vehicles, the way we plan our vacations. Technology is driving nearly everything we do. Tech-savvy consumers want access to virtually everything they do with the touch of their hand using their smartphone or online application. Traditionally, taxi cabs have served as the most common form of for hire transportation for centuries. Taxi cabs have conveniently been hailed from the street and clearly marked with signage. From the beginning, taxi cabs have been equipped with a taxi meter, allowing the fare to be calculated in front of the passenger. While taxi cabs have added features over the years to benefit consumers, taxi cabs still remain virtually the same over the past century. In contrast, alternative forms of transportation continue to move into the market focused on offering the same service with a different look. Technology is now linking drivers using their personal vehicles with tech-savvy consumers. I will call these peer-to-peer -peer transportation network vehicles in this evening presentation. Peer-to-peer -peer vehicles cannot be hailed from the street, but must be prearranged through an online application. They are typically marked with a removable symbol, and the fare is calculated through an online application. This technology also requires consumers to download an app, set up an online profile, and maintain a credit card on file. This technology also allows the consumer and driver to rate one another for the benefit of future transactions. Obviously, technology is changing the way we arrange transportation. Many consumers want the ability to hit a button on their phone, know a ride is on the way, and have the fare charged to their credit card without ever reaching for their wallet. While we know that this technology is not new, the form in which it is being offered is changing local taxi companies have been partnering with popular apps that work the same way. When consumers request a ride through an app, they know that a taxi cab will be coming. Consumers know what to expect. When consumers log into a peer-to-peer -peer company app, they know a vehicle will be coming that doesn't fit the traditional look and feel of a taxi cab. They can expect a driver in their personal vehicle that is not equipped with a taxi meter, has limited signage, and relies on an online app to determine the fare or suggested donation. At the end of the day, whether a consumer is using a traditional peer-to-peer -peer vehicle it is about consumer protection and consumer choice. The city of Columbus has to ensure the public that all for hire vehicles are safe, properly inspected, and that all drivers meet our standards. We don't know the full impact that this technology will have on the local vehicle for hire industry. Ultimately, the competition will determine the ratio of traditional and alternative mode of transportation needed to balance the market. Those providing clean vehicles, reliable service, and excellent customer service will be highly competitive, while others may suffer. In the end, it requires everyone to step up their game and provide the best service and price possible to the consumer. Finally, I realize that we have had two peer-to-peer -peer companies launch their services prior to the City Council passing legislation. These companies are currently advertising their services for free, meaning they are not in violation of the City Code. We will continue to monitor the services, and if we discover that they are charging a fare, the license section will undertake enforcement action. I will now ask Amanda Ford to present a presentation for this council. Thank you. Good evening, Council Member Mills. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, before I start into this, I really want to stress that these are just proposed changes. They're not final by any means. Um, I know that that's been a concern for the Vehicle for Hire Board when I spoke to them yesterday. So I just want to stress that this is truly in draft format and that we will review um, any recommendations that we get. 
basically our agenda for tonight is we have several codes that we will be looking to make changes, some minor changes too. Obviously 501, licensing regulation generally, 505, the Board of Appeals, 585, vehicle for hire board, 587, the owner's license, 589, driver's license, 591, taxi cabs. And then two newly created code sections, 588, peer-to-peer -peer transportation network companies, and 590, peer-to-peer -peer transportation network licensed drivers. I'll start with 501. Um, as you're well aware, we were just here, um, maybe last month I think it was, looking to repeal multiple codes um, out of Title V. So now that those codes have been repealed, we need to go back and update 501 to reflect those changes. So as part of that, um, we did just some reorganization of the code sections themselves. Um, the order wasn't flowing well, so we made some changes there. We updated the terminology. It makes several references to chairman or he, so we made that gender, gender neutral to be chairperson. Um, we updated the code numbers that are under the license section numbers. So we removed some codes and then added code sections that have been added over the years that did not get updated as part of this code. We updated the look back period for background checks from five years to seven years to be consistent with what we have in our commercial sales and our vehicle for hire codes. We moved the section titled photographs. In the past, um, those choosing to be licensed could bring a photograph in as part of their um, ID, but now the license section actually takes those photographs for them, so we just removed that section altogether. And the penalties section is unchanged right now, but I'm working with the prosecutor's office. The one thing that we've consistently heard is that, you know, the penalties are not strong enough for repeat offenders for violating the code. So it may, obviously may not be a part of this code change, but I do want you to know that we are reaching out to the prosecutor's office and they're working and reviewing those penalty sections of our, all of our codes. For the repeat offenders. 505, the Board of License Appeals, Obviously, this required some updating because of changes to 501 and changing that order, so we had to update some code numbers and then just minimal changes with corrected, corrected numbering, a few grammars, and making things gender neutral once again. So those are the only changes to 505. Obviously, most of the changes come from the vehicle for hire codes. Obviously, the reason for these codes are new companies seeking to enter the market. And I won't go through all the things that we went through earlier, but obviously online apps have become more popular for arranging transportation. And we know that our local taxi industry has been using these services for quite some time now. Um, obviously, consumers want access to this service in Columbus. Um, several visitors obviously use this service in other cities when they're traveling either for work or, or play, and they want the ability to use that here locally. But in the end, public safety is our top concern. Obviously, consumer protection, making sure that drivers are meeting our standards, vehicles are being inspected, and that proper requirements are in place. And obviously, enforcement is a key piece of this as well. And I will say the license job has done an excellent job over the last few months really stepping up enforcement on all Title V codes, not just vehicles for hire, but for all Title V sections. Um, just a quick recap of what the current industry looks like. We have 530, 530 taxi cab licenses and then an additional 30 that are wheelchair accessible vehicles. We have 143 licensed liveries, 28 pedicabs, two horse carriages, and then obviously new to the local industry are Lyft and Uber X. Due diligence. Um, Lyft came in and presented their business model, I believe it was in December, to the Vehicle for Hire Board. Um, you know, I, although I had heard that presentation from Lyft, I didn't feel that it was my responsibility necessarily to educate. I felt it was much better for Lyft to come in and have that conversation with the board so they could hear it directly for them on how they um, would like to operate in Columbus. You know, obviously I've talked openly with the board over the last few months that I have been meeting with these companies to talk about legislation and potential changes. Um, we did hold a special meeting with the Vehicle for Hire Board yesterday mm -hmm. um, just to present the same changes that we're presenting tonight. I will be very honest that there, there was one small change that there was a lot of support for, but um, there was not a lot of support for these proposed changes. So obviously, you know, I wrote down the feedback that I got from them yesterday, and we'll take that back to the table along with the feedback that we received tonight. So it, their feedback really is valuable, and we will take that into consideration. A quick summary of the changes. Um, one major change is giving the Director of Public Safety the authority to issue, deny, or transfer licenses. It allows peer-to-peer -peer companies to legally operate in the city, 
requires these companies to be licensed and requires their drivers to be licensed. Proposed changes to 585, the Vehicle for Hire Board. Obviously, it includes peer-to-peer -peer vehicles as a form of for hire transportation. Once again, we're changing that definition of prearranged. I know it was just updated um, back in January or December when we made some changes to the livery code. And I still foresee some additional changes to this. Obviously, you know, reviewing it again over the weekend, um, I think on the peer-to-peer -peer side, there still needs to be a few wording changes. But a livery, when pre being prearranged through a livery shall mean an agreement to provide transportation by registration through phone dispatch or an online application in advance of boarding from a specific location at an agreed upon rate. Prearranged as it relates to peer to peer shall mean a ride solicited and accepted via a licensed peer to peer transportation networks company's electronic application before the ride commences. Um, just some of my initial thoughts is I, I think we need that in advance. Um, boarding from a specific location. So we'll probably match up a little more of that terminology. And obviously we had to add some definitions. First online application shall mean a web-based application that's used to connect drivers and passengers through pre-arrangement for the purpose of arranging transportation for the public generally as passengers for hire, gift, donation, or other consideration. The peer-to-peer -peer transportation network, and we kind of go back and forth in the code when we refer to things on the online application or a peer-to-peer -peer transportation network, so we felt it was important to include both definitions. So the network shall mean an online application used to connect passengers to peer-to-peer -peer transportation network drivers through prearrangement, who uses his or her personal vehicle for the purpose of transporting the public, generally as passengers for hire, gift, donation, or other consideration, either directly or indirectly. The peer-to-peer -peer company shall mean every corporation, association, joint stock association, person, firm, or partnership operating a peer-to-peer -peer transportation network to connect passengers to drivers using their personal vehicle through pre-arrangement. As you can see, there's kind of a consistency in the, the definitions. They all kind of run together. The peer-to-peer -peer drivers shall mean any individual driving, operating, or in physical control of a peer-to-peer -peer transportation network vehicle. And the vehicles are defined as a personal vehicle used by a peer-to-peer -peer, um, driver engaged in the transportation of persons with the intent to receive indirect compensation from a peer-to-peer -peer company that is prearranged and determined by a combination of, a mi of mileage, rate of speed, or length of time the vehicle is used providing such transportation. Those are all the definitions that we added. And one thing I forgot to include in here, one definition that we did take out was the definition of operator. Um, it appears in 591, so I'll go over that shortly, but uh, I just forgot to include that in the PowerPoint that we did remove that definition. Um, the board we're recommending will go from 15 to 17 members. The livery representatives have always been two livery owners, but as we know, that industry is changing with the um, the online applications being used to help um, arrange some of those transportation modes, we felt that it would be more appropriate to have one owner and one driver. So the owner will be required to have a fleet of five or more vehicles, and then we will have one driver represented. Um, it's a little more consistent with how we have taxi cab owners and drivers represented. We felt it would be more appropriate now that that livery industry is changing to have an owner and a driver both. The peer-to-peer -peer transportation representatives, um, we initially recommended one company and one driver. Um, obviously, the most important piece of that is having the driver representative on the board. You know, they're working day in and day out in that industry and can offer a lot of valuable input. Finally, the powers of the board. The board will no longer have the authority to grant, deny, or transfer a license. This authority will be given to the Director of Public Safety. Um, this is one area the board is supportive of. We um, had an incident a few months ago where we were talking about approving livery licenses and it came up that uh, they needed to be reviewed by the board first. So after an opinion from the city attorney's office, it was determined that all licenses could only be approved at a vehicle for hire board meeting. So some of these individuals have been waiting three and four weeks to have either their license approved or it transferred from vehicle to vehicle, which is, you know, it's downtime for some of these drivers, especially you total your vehicle on the first of the month you may have to wait till the end of the month to transfer that vehicle. So um, the last thing we want to do is hurt their business and keep them moving. So those are all the changes to the actual vehicle for hire board code itself that we're proposing. 
onto 587, the owner's license, um, all changes are once again associated with giving the director that authority. So it's just removing the word board, replacing it with director. Same with 589, and then removal of that term operator. Um, there were two places in the code we still referred to the operator as a driver, and that's not how we refer to them. So it's just a small little update. And then finally, 591 taxi cabs. Um, we have to make one small change because of a change in 585. Removing that term operator changes all the numbers on the definitions. So it refers to a special trip now being defined as GG instead of HH. So it's just one small little correction to make sure that we're referencing the correct code section in the, the code itself. Now we'll move on to the newly created codes, 588 Peer-to-Peer -peer Transportation Network Company. This code requires all peer-to-peer -peer companies operating in the city to obtain a license. So they must submit an application along with um, supporting documentation that's required, pay a license fee of $500. Obviously, this license fee is still being evaluated. Um, this was just kind of an initial starting point as we can evaluate um, the time it's gonna take to process the applications and the amount of communication that's gonna um, occur between these companies and the license section. So we'll still be evaluating that license fee. Provide evidence of liability protection and a photograph of their trade dress. As in all of our other vehicle for hire codes, the board may adopt rules and regulations. The license will expire annually on May 31st and licenses may not be transferred from one company to another. They are required to maintain certain records. The companies are required to maintain for six months all vehicle information, including driver name, license plate number, make, model, and year and color of the vehicle, and electronic records of each trip. Obviously, we require all of our vehicle for hire drivers and owners to maintain trip sheets with the exception of pedicabs, but they're all required to maintain those records for six months. Upon request, drivers are required to show physical or electronic records of the ride in progress enough to establish that it was prearranged. Obviously, these vehicles are not allowed to hail from the street. They all have to be prearranged through the app. Um, if the license section or license officer or a police officer pull over one of these vehicles, they are required to show them that yes, it is a paying fare in the, in the car and they can throw that, show that through their phone app, but the drivers are not required to relinquish custody of their phone. Obviously, unless there's some type of criminal activity, then it leads to a bigger issue. But just to prove whether this is a fare in the car or not, they are required to show it but not give up custody of that phone. And then the director has the authority to audit driver records and trip sheets as necessary. And the t that would typically only happen if um, we have a driver under investigation is typically when he would request those records. Grounds for permanent revocation, revocation and suspension. Um, these are just a few of the main ones that I pulled out, there are some others that are relevant in all of our for hire codes. Um, permitting an unlicensed driver to operate, prearranging rides for a driver that does not meet the requirements, failing to maintain driver records, permitting drivers to accept street hails or solicit passengers, and failing to summons another vehicle if the vehicle becomes disabled. Obviously, this is key. We, do, you know, we don't want to tie up consumers. Um, you know, obviously accidents happen or uh, cars break down every day, but we just want to make sure that they have kind of a plan in place for contacting another vehicle to take that passenger on their ride. The company standards. Companies are required to complete the following for each individual prior to giving them access to the network. A national and local background check that goes back seven years that meets our standards. Look at their driver abstract and provide driver training program for their drivers. They're not, they're not permitted to own any vehicles or a fleet of vehicles. There's no limit to the number of vehicles. Obviously, this is a huge concern for the industry, um, not placing a moratorium on the number of vehicles or drivers. You know, and this is a, a big discussion that we've had internally. You know, we realize that while some of their drivers may be full-time drivers who don't have an opportunity to get a taxi cab license, um, they may be full-time drivers, but they do, they tend to focus on recruiting students who need flexible hours to operate when it's convenient for them to operate. The rides must be fewer than seven passengers, including the driver. They must provide live access to the GP, GPS maps, including vehicle locations. You know, obviously I understand this may be a concern for the companies, but it's really assist us with the enforcement efforts. 
you know, as long as their drivers are following the rules and they're all properly licensed, this shouldn't be an issue. When obviously when notified that a driver is under investigation, they need to immediately suspend access to driver mode for that driver pending the investigation by the director. The electronic application requirements, they must display the following for passengers, a picture of the driver, a picture of the vehicle including the license plate number, the ability to indicate if that passenger requires a wheelchair accessible vehicle or has other needs, electronic notifications of all fees charged to their credit card, and a platform for allowing drivers and passengers to rate one another to ensure ratings are not based on unlawful discrimination. Um, based on my understanding of these rating systems, it's really about what your overall experience was in the vehicle. So I don't believe they have the option to comment. It's based on you give somebody a number of stars based on their overall experience. You know, did they provide good customer service? Was the car neat and clean? So that's my understanding of the rating system. The website and app must display the following. The app facilitates rides for the drivers for, sorry, the app facilitates rides with drivers using their personal vehicles and insurance requirements and a phone number and email for the license section. So if they would like to file a formal complaint with the license section, that information is readily available. A zero tolerance policy for drugs and alcohol. Companies must provide on the app, the website, and receipts information about the policies and ways to report a driver. They must include a phone number or in-app call function and email to report a driver. Upon complaint, the company must suspend the driver and contact the director. So that's if the company suspends that driver. They need to make contact with the director. And the app and website must include the email address for complaints to the director. So we've set, we've set up an email, license complaints at columbus.gov to take all of these complaints in. And this can be more than just for vehicles for hire. We would also use the same email for any complaints against any of the licenses that we issue. Vehicle standards, they must be reasonably neat and clean. They may be a sedan, van, minivan, SUV, or truck with no significant modifications, not older than eight years old. This is obviously in line with our livery vehicles and the phased in approach we have with our taxi cabs to get to that eight year point. A minimum of four doors, the working passenger light, safety and shatterproof glass, and safety belts for each passenger. Distinctive trade dress. It may be a symbol or a sign on a vehicle, roof, grill, or the, um, the door of the vehicle. As you can see, just because these are our two local companies that are um, operating currently, the pink mustache and then the U for Uber. They must be visible from 50 feet and may, may, may be magnetic or removable. We realize that a lot of these drivers are not full-time drivers, so they need the ability to take that off since it is their personal vehicle when they're not um, available for hire. And obviously these companies are required to keep their fair rate on schedule, or their fair rate schedule um, on file with the director's office as we require all of our other vehicle for hires. The insurance requirements. You know, this has been a big issue of concern of ours, and internally we still continue to talk about this um, issue of insurance. So we would require the companies maintain commercial liability insurance, providing not less than one million per incident. It must be available regardless of whether a driver maintains adequate insurance to cover a claim, and it must be approved by the city attorney's office. Obviously, you know, we've had, we've had a lot of conversations with them about this, and we're still continuing to work with some outside insurance organizations to help us sort through this issue of insurance. Obviously, we need to make sure consumers are protected, but we don't want to leave drivers at risk either. Um, they must submit their annual statement of claims and judgments, and judgments not paid in 30 days will result in revocation of license, which are also consistent with our other vehicles for hire. Now moving on to 590, the peer-to-peer -peer transportation network driver's license. Obviously, the board may adopt rules and regulations. Their operation requirements include drivers must obtain a driver's license. They must serve as an independent contractor for a licensed peer-to-peer -peer company. So in order to be licensed with us, the company that they choose to work for must also be licensed. They must display their driver identification card. They must display their city-issued decal. And the license is not required if they're only dropping off in the city and not picking up. Um, I know this is a concern we talked about with the Vehicle for Hire Board yesterday. This is consistent with all of our for hire vehicles. Um, we don't have jurisdiction outside the city of Columbus, so we can't control what the surrounding areas do, so we can't require 
those individuals to be licensed, um, but we can work on enforcement that if they are picking up in the city of Columbus, um, they are required to have our license. The application requirements, they must be a citizen of the United States, hold a valid Ohio driver's license for a minimum of six months, be 21 years or older. Uh, our vehicle for hire drivers right now can be 18 or older, but we understand this is a requirement that these companies have internally, so we chose to include their age limits. Speak, read, and write English. Provide a letter from the licensed company saying they've met background standards and have passed the driver training program. So along with that application process, they need to submit a copy of their national and local background check so that we can verify that they do meet the standards the same way with their driver abstract. They have to provide a vehicle mechanical inspection that's been completed by a third party. And then obviously here, another issue with the insurance. Um, you know, where it stands right now, we're still working on what these amounts would be, but having a letter from their insurance company showing proof of liability, comprehensive and collision automobile coverage, and that the company is aware that they're working as a peer-to-peer -peer vehicle. Um, you know, we feel that we probably need to set some minimum standards for coverage in this, but we're still, we're just still working through that process. Um, you know, the biggest fear is you have a student who's attending OSU, and mom and dad live in Southern Ohio and have no idea that this is what their child is doing to, mm -hmm. to earn a little extra money. And, um, you know, and if something happens, we would hate to see them lose, lose coverage and then the parents not be aware of um, what the child, or I shouldn't call them a child, what the young adult was um, doing to earn a little extra money. So we just want them to be aware that they're operating in that manner. Obviously, they're required to have a physical and evidence of at least one year driving experience. And these requirements, um, I know they're not ideal for the companies. I know that you know, they obviously are not supportive of having some of these requirements, but we feel like we have to do our due diligence to make sure that these standards are being met. You know, not that you, you believe everything you read in the media, but time after time we've seen where things are slipping through the cracks. So we feel like at least if we see proof that they're meeting these requirements, we're more comfortable moving forward with issuing them a license. Um, the initial license fee we talked about was $25. Obviously, this is still something that we can negotiate. We realize that our other vehicle for hire drivers pay a $50 fee, so this is something we'll continue to evaluate. They'll expire on April 30th of each year. Obviously, they have background standards, which is seven years and consistent with all of our other drivers. Um, when looking at their driver abstracts, they can't have any more than two moving violations or five points in a three-year period and our actual vehicle for hire drivers are, can have up to eight points in three years. So, you know, they have a little stricter standards when it comes to their driver driving record. Driver standards. The license officer may inspect a driver upon complaint or if found to not be in compliance with the standards. And the driver shall not operate a vehicle if under the influence of intoxicating liquors or drugs talk or text on a mobile phone or smartphone while a fare is in the vehicle and solicit or accept passengers on the street. They all have to be done through the app prearranged. Vehicle inspections, they must have a vehicle mechanical inspection completed by a third party on forms provided by the license section. The license officer must also complete their normal for hire inspection that they complete on all of our other vehicles. And the license officer must provide in, write, in writing any reasons why they failed. And then we would also imply that $25 reinspection fee each time they had to come back to um, fix any issues that the license officer failed them for. Grounds for revocation and suspensions. Majority of theirs are consistent with our other drivers. Um, just two that we included that I thought are important to mention are obviously soliciting and accepting passengers from the street and not through prearrangement and accumulating more than the two moving violations or five points in three years. Obviously, upon revocation or suspension, the peer-to-peer -peer company must suspend the driver's access to the app pending the investigation, and the drivers may appeal their suspension to the Board of Appeals. The penalties currently are consistent with what we have for vehicle for hire drivers. Um, this is another issue that I've reached out with the prosecutor's office on. You know, we continue to have some vehicle, unlicensed vehicle for hire owners or drivers out there operating, 
and the, the penalties just don't seem to be enough to get them to go through the licensing process. So we're working on some stricter penalties. So whether they go through with any, you know, upcoming code changes, we'll see how, kind of what we go through with the prosecutor's office to make sure that we're putting in reasonable penalties, but that they will also be upheld in court. And finally, I know that there's been a lot of conversation about that blurring line between all the different industries and um, what the difference in those vehicles are. So we looked at taxis, liveries, and peer-to-peers. The vehicles themselves, all the four-door variety, uh, with the exception of the peer-to-peer, -peer, is a personal vehicle. Markings, taxis are clearly marked with lettering and an overhead light. Liveries require no markings. And peer-to-peer -peer will, will be marked by a removable sign or symbol. Access, taxis can be hailed from the street or, or prearranged through dispatch or an online app. Liveries are prearranged through contract or online app. And peer-to-peer -peer are prearranged only through an online app. The insurance requirements, taxi cabs are required to carry 300,000 in commercial liability insurance. Livery, a half a million in commercial liability. And the peer-to-peer, -peer, obviously they have their personal automobile insurance, but then the company's $1 million policy as well. The fare, obviously taxis work with the taxi meter, so the calculation of time and distance, and the fare is computed in front of the passenger. For liveries, it's an agreed upon fare prior to the ride beginning, so the fare is either calculated by time and distance through the online app or through an hourly rate. And for peer-to-peer, -peer, the customer is given the fare at the end of the ride, and the fare is calculated by time and distance through an online app. Payments, taxis, fortunately, still take cash or credit card. Liveries, you have the option to pay cash, but majority of that is done through credit cards. Um, and the, if you do it through an online app, the credit card is required. And the peer-to-peer -peer is credit card only. And finally, personal information. Taxis, they don't require you as a consumer to share, share any personal information with them. For a livery, if it's a contract, you know, if you choose to pay with the credit card, you have to share that, but it just requires a signed contract. But if you do it through an online app, it does require a profile with personal information, including your, maintaining your credit card information on file. And then for peer-to-peer, -peer, obviously it does require that online profile with personal information, including your credit card. At the Vehicle for Hire Board meeting, um, obviously there were lots of concerns expressed. We gave them an opportunity to um, bring up all their concerns and listen to them, and I made lots of notes. A few things that really stand out, um, they felt like peer-to-peers should not be represented on the Vehicle for Hire Board. Um, I personally think, obviously, if we can set rules and regulations with those companies and drivers, that there should be some representation so that industry does have a voice. Insurance requirements for companies and drivers, I agree it's still a concern and something that we're working through. The cost of the license fees. PCI compliance, um, this was something that I had looked into, you know, just strictly working with Lyft and Uber X to make sure that they were PCI compliant, and they are. I forgot to write it into the code myself, so that was kind of a mess up on my part, and that's an easy fix. We can definitely get that in there. We talked about enforcement and how important enforcement is with all four higher vehicles, um, but it's specifically with the new companies operating without any regulation. Um, taking business away from taxi cabs. Obviously, I heard that quite a bit. And then um, they all requested more time to work on legislation. You know, we didn't give any timelines of when we planned to move forward and reassured them that this was purely a draft and that we would take all the input from yesterday and today and uh, take that back to the table. And just one last thing. I want to remind consumers that they should use caution at this point when using any peer-to-peer -peer service. You know, they're often referred to as ride sharing. The drivers may or may not have been properly vetted, and the vehicles may or may not have been inspected. So I just want consumers to be cautious about using this service until we have them properly regulated. Some helpful tips until legislation is passed. Avoid using the service. Make certain that the driver picture and the vehicle information match what the app sends you. So when that car pulls up, make sure that information is matching. 
and contact the license section with any complaints. So I've got the, the 645-8366 number and the license complaints at columbus.gov email up there. So I would definitely encourage people if they have any problems to file a complaint with the license section. So I will now turn it over to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Amanda, I have several questions, as uh, some of these you are aware of. And Director Brown, please feel free to uh, chime in wherever you see necessary. But I will take this opportunity. I believe our time for speaker slips have come and gone. So I believe we have uh, received a significant number. I also want to take this time to uh, thank you for the presentation. Remind everyone these are draft changes and proposed changes just so that everyone is, is really clear. And I wish that the last slide had been our first slide because it is certainly what's first when looking at any of these changes is the consumer. Who is this impacting in our city? So the last slide I see is the most important slide for the evening. But starting with my questions related to the reason for the vehicle for higher changes, I wanted to make sure that we reiterate to our uh, audience here this evening and those listening that the changes made at the state level put us in a position to making the changes that we see here. Now that was to the definition of livery vehicles. So that was kind of the start. Um, I'm not aware of any changes that the state has made to address peer to peer as, as what is being presented tonight. Um, but the livery changes in the state ORC did prompt some of those initial changes to the livery code a few months ago. Thank you. Moving on uh, to my next question, um, in response to due diligence and allowing uh, the two companies that this will impact, Lyft and UberX, to provide uh, conversation to the vehicle for hire board, I just wanted to make sure there was proper opportunity to ask questions to uh, the folks presenting from Lyft and uh, UberX. UberX has not presented to the board um, they present, Uber presented um, some information to the subcommittee that we had when we were talking about delivery changes. Lyft did come in and present um, to the board and they did have an opportunity to ask questions of the Lyft representative. Okay, thank you. I'm moving through my list of questions. Bear with me just a second. I wanted to um, ask a question related to the vehicle for higher board and the representation. The peer-to-peer -peer representatives being one company and one driver is in line with the way the representation currently works for taxi cabs, is that correct? Yeah, that's what our taxi cabs, we have um, one, one owner of a company, it's like 25 vehicles, in a, over 25 vehicles, and we have a less than 25 owners, and then a driver representative. So if I understand correctly, one company with 25 drivers has a vote, and now this company, I'm not sure the driver capacity will have a one vote as well? They would have one vote. The way it's currently proposed, we would have one company representative and then one driver representative. Okay, I'm going to take a little bit of... Uh, exploration at, at the makeup related to that based on uh, equity and the voting and representation in terms of from drivers Absolutely. versus companies. Absolutely. My next question is, um, did I understand correctly in terms of given the authority allows for uh, there not to be any interruption in the ability for the company and the drivers to, con to continue until a decision has been made? Did I understand that clearly? Absolutely. Um, when they come into the license section now to file, um, whether it's um, applying for a new license or the transfer of an owner to owner or vehicle to vehicle, they'll be able to do that immediately upon approval to make sure all the, if the, all the documentation is in order, um, it won't have to wait until a board meeting to be approved. You know, obviously we give that approval to the director. So if the license section has concerns, they will take those with him. And I did share with the board yesterday that the license section could still put together the list that they do for the monthly meeting so that they can see what activity is taking place. I felt like that information is still important to share with them, but just so that they are aware, but the license section would be able to issue those without their authority. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go back to the vehicle for hire board. That was a concern raised yesterday, and was a concern about the representation or was a concern about 
no representation at all. Just so I understand what the feedback was from the vehicle fire board yesterday. For the peer-to-peer? -peer? Yeah, that's what, um, my understanding was they just didn't feel like they should be represented on the board at all. So, at all, yeah. And, and you know, I feel like we, if we're gonna vote on rules and regulations that directly impact their industry, we need some type of representation. So if we choose just to have a driver representative, you know, I just think they need some representation. Just as we added for pedicabs, when we added them under the regulation, we included a pedicab operator. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna address the, the fee question here in terms of the license fee of $500 for the company. Um, I am going to take another look at, at the fee structure there because it appears to be a low fee and just take a look at what services we're providing on our end that makes that fee justifiable where it is or, or we incur more um, expenses. As you know, previous legislation and council amendments that I've made to assure that we have the capacity within the license section and that's prior to some of these other changes and we have some more coming in front of us that I think will um, cause some challenges to capacity on our side of, of supporting some of the new changes to vehicle for hire. My next question is in regards to the rules and regulations. Um, if you would please uh, for, and I know that you've probably shared this with me and countless occasions, but it just one example for the audience and the viewing audience an example of a rules and reg change that's different than what would be impacted through the code. Just one example of a rules and reg change. Yeah, that's what, um, obviously a lot of things addressed in rules and regs are things like dress codes. Um, typically age limits are addressed in rules and regulations. Um, so obviously we did put an age limit for the peer-to-peer -peer vehicles in the code, but at some point we would move that to rules and regulations. But we understand with it being a new section of the code, we wanted to make sure that that was in there um, immediately so that there were the, re the age restrictions in there. But um, I'm trying to think what else is in there. We've got, there's some vehicle inspection information in there. So it covers a variety of things just so we don't have to get into such specifics in the code. Thank you. I just wanted that for the benefit of the listening because sometimes it's what's code, what's rules and regs, not everyone because they don't get the benefit of hearing this repeatedly like you and I do what really is codes and what's really rules and regulations. I'm going to ask a question related to records in 588 related to our benefit and from a safety standpoint and consumer protection, what the access to the records bring to us as to why we've asked for this in all the different um, transportation modes within vehicle for hire. Um, typically in the past when we've had to re request those documents, it's typically related to a complaint or an investigation about a driver. Um, sometimes you just need confirmation that yes, the ride did take place and the documentation to back that up. Um, obviously these companies hold driver information, so we want that ability to be able to review that if we have a pending investigation against a driver. And my next question, Director Brown, I think this might be a, a question for you, um, and perhaps maybe a, a police question, if you will, but if you could elaborate for the audience and those um, viewing, live access, what would that mean for us when we look at live access um, to the GPS maps and what that means in terms of, for us from a safety standpoint? Basically, Councilmember, that, that allows the law enforcement to deal with uh, the aspect of where these vehicles are at all times. Um, when we have to, if we get a particular complaint, we want to be able to respond as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, depending upon what the circumstances are. Uh, like with cabs, we know we can find them very, very easily. With this circumstance, it's a lot different because the vehicles are not marked as clearly, and therefore being able to address the issue through a GPS makes our ability to be able to respond far more rapidly and more appropriate. And with that in mind, in terms of a training from the enforcement side of that, this um, will have an impact in terms of making sure that our folks are adequately trained and ready to identify should we have to in, intervene in any particular situation on the side of safety for the public. 
Uh, Councilmember, certainly what we do, anytime we have any type of changes to the way in which the public is going to be impacted, we make sure that the, uh, our law enforcement officers are educated to be aware of those circumstances. It certainly would take some time, but we know where the concentration is and we'll spend time to make sure that those folks who are responding in those particular areas, primarily downtown and areas where we have uh, entertainment venues, we'll make certain that our officers are educated and understand what the circumstances are. Thank you. Next question I had in regards to um, receiving notification, and I think you answered this already. If there is a uh, pending investigation, everyone is notified, the company, the driver, just engage me in a little bit around the investigation um, and the suspension of the um, access to the app for the driver if he or she is under investigation. When a complaint is filed with the license section, obviously there is notification with the driver. We would be required to notify these companies to make sure that they suspend that driver's access because we also suspend their um, their peer-to-peer -peer driver's license. So there is communication. Everybody is properly notified. Um, a hearing with the director will be scheduled. Um, so once the hearing is complete and the director's made his ruling, it'll determine whether there's a suspension, revocation, permanent revocation, depending on the um, penalties and the, the crime, that, so to say, that was committed, or the violation, I should say. And let, let me ask a question in terms of, because uh, the drivers will be on in their own vehicles in that, it, if in fact a driver, are they allowed to pick up a passenger while they perhaps may have their own children in their own vehicle with them. Can you share with me a little bit about how that works? You know, it, that is not addressed in the code, but that's an excellent point. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to check with the companies as well to see what their, you know, if they have any rules against that, but that's an excellent point and something that we just hasn't really come up. Okay, because they're allowed to, if a passenger is seeking, and regardless of the type of passenger from the consumer protection, who else is in the vehicle, if it is their own children and they're picking up passengers, I'm curious and would like more information related to that and what we can do in terms of guarding the public related to that and working with the companies and the drivers. Again, going back to the fact that the last slide is the most important slide informing the public when making choices. Their choices do come with some responsibility, but I think we should certainly look at how that works when we talk about children being in a vehicle. That's extremely important to me. Okay. Uh, next question that I had in regards to um, the notification, um, I think you answered that all the complaints would go to the director and this email will be visible for those and, and available on the app for filing complaints, correct? Yeah, we'll require them to have that on the app and we'll also have it um, on the license section website as well so that people can file a complaint through the website. Thank you. Uh, my next question I wanted to um, ask in terms of the network um, transportation network driver's license. Again, encouraging folks to understand um, how all this works and who's licensed and what the requirements are. Just thought I'd take another opportunity to indicate that to the public. Moving into um, my questions related to the application requirements, the owning of their own car. Is that a requirement, the car being in their own name, and are we proposing any necessity of that? Using your example of a student at The Ohio State University moonlighting and being a driver, and maybe the car is not owned by them, owned by their parent because of the age here, what are, are there any uh, indications related to that? You know, it's a good question. Um, I know the company typically will start that initial screening process. So, you know, I'm not certain how they would respond if the vehicle is not in their name. Um, so it's something we, we need to look at to see if we need to address that in the code. Because you're right, you know, I'm, my, my vehicle's in dad's name and I'm here going to school. So, no, that's an excellent question. Thank you. And I am concerned, going back to that same example, in terms of the driving experience being one year minimum, in addition to that, the age of being 21, um, I think I just got a handle of driving now, quite honestly. So um, just, just some questions there. Um, and there are probably more astute drivers than myself. 
wanted to raise the question about if there was any um, other um, national standards related to how some of the peer-to-peer -peer transportation networks and companies are operating related to age and driver experiences that we can learn from. Most of what I've seen, the driver age has either been 18 or 21. I believe it's the requirement of both of these companies that they, they won't um, bring on a driver who's not 21 years old. Um, so that's what most of the standards are set around that because that's their standard. Um, I know for our vehicle for hires for taxi cabs and liveries, they only have to be 18, you know, so they are newer drivers at that point. So um, honestly, I like the fact that they don't want to bring anybody on under the age of 21 because I, I agree. I feel like sometimes I just got the hang of it and wonder if I still do some days. So, uh, but, um, but no, I think uh, that 21 age limit is pretty consistent throughout the licensing process in other cities. And my next question is, how will the Vehicle for Hire Board or the director um, receive proof that there has been um, limited, the access has stopped to a particular driver? Will we receive proof or notification that that has actually happened um, from the companies who are operating a peer-to-peer -peer network? Obviously, we would ask for some type of notification that that has actually occurred. We'd need some proof of that happening, absolutely. And one last question. I, I know we um, touched on this just a bit when we first were undergoing these changes, and I remember uh, meeting with the mayor about all kind of different things we were looking at and incentivize and medallion and all that. Has there been any additional follow-up discussions as we see all of these different vehicles um, on our streets? Has there been any continued discussion with the Vehicle for Hire Board? And if not, I'd like to begin those discussions related to any incentives uh, in terms of environment-friendly vehicles? I am, I, there was some consideration given, and Ramona may be able to provide a little more information on this, um, but I know there has been some conversations about um, some requests for environmental friendlies. Ramona, do you wanna touch on this? Yes, Chair Mills, we had some discussions at the board level about this. Um, we talked about incentives, especially for the new wheelchair handicap accessible vehicles that um, we just put on the street. A lot of those came out of Yellow Cab as propane vehicles, and they've approached us about extending the life of those vehicles per the rules and regulations. So there has been discussions regarding that. Okay, I like those discussions to continue, and as we talk about more vehicles making more trips, um, I think that that we need to consider from an emission standpoint, an environment standpoint, that we um, take a look at that. I believe we are now at the portion of our hearing where it is time to hear from those who are impacted by this and ready and willing to share their thoughts and feedback related to the drafted and proposed vehicle for hire changes. I want to thank everyone for coming, and I will ask that everyone please be respectful in their comments, approach the podium, share their name, address, and organization that you represent. Each individual who is signed to speak will have three minutes to share their comments related to tonight's hearing. I want to first ask ahead and in advance for apologies related to any mispronunciations of anyone's name. I am sometimes challenged by handwriting and also by pronunciation. So please um, forgive me and accept my apologies in advance should I uh, make an error in pronouncing your name and or organization you represent. Our first speaker this evening looks like Dr. Matt Sharples. Mr. Sharples, if I have that correct, if you please approach the podium, share your first and last name, and please correct it if it needs to be. Sir, you have three minutes to speak on tonight's hearing related to the vehicle for higher proposed changes. Thank you, Council Member Mills. Um, my name is Matt Sharples. I reside at 10100 Houndsdale Drive in Pickerington, Ohio, and I am here representing the drivers of Lyft. Um, 
I just wanted to, to take a moment to really let you know um, what the response has been in the two weeks that, uh, that we've been operating as, as drivers here in Columbus. Uh, in the first two weeks, I uh, did over 120 plus lifts uh, to residents of the area, and the response has been phenomenal. Um, everyone that's gotten in my car has had nothing but positive things to say. They're grateful that Lyft is here and that there's other services like, like Lyft available. Um, personally, uh, the company tracks our ratings, uh, and I have received a five-star rating on, on all those uh, lifts I've given, and uh, the comments have been amazing. Everything from feels like I'm riding with a friend to uh, grateful that he had hot chocolate on my morning commute. Um, all kinds of positive things, and it's just been really well embraced thus far, and, uh, and it's an exciting thing for me. Um, you know, I have a full-time job outside of this, but I, I actually use Lyft as a, as a stress reliever. So um, it's a lot of fun, and, and I hope that the council will, uh, will allow it to continue to uh, thrive here in Columbus. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Mr. Jim Black. Mr. Black, if you'll please approach the podium. You have three minutes. Please share your first and last name in any organizations you represent and your address. And sure. please uh, share your comments related to tonight's hearing. Hey, my name is Jim Black. I'm Executive Vice President of Lyft. Uh, my address is 185 Clara Street, San Francisco, California. Um, thank you, Council Member Mills, Director Brown, Assistant Director Ford, and Ms. Patz and the Vehicle for Hire Board. Uh, innovation and technology have helped Lyft to create a safe, convenient, efficient, and environmentally sound mode of transportation. Uh, as you've heard, Lyft's model is different and involves a different way of doing things. The Lyft model is not based on old taxi laws. The Lyft model was designed to leverage technology and to create the safest method of ground transportation available. Um, this involves additional steps with, that were not available just a few years ago. Through technology, every Lyft ride can be immediately rated by passengers. Through technology, every match passenger can be tracked. We can track who got into whose car, where, when, at what time, and where they went. Uh, through technology, a driver on the Lyft platform, as you heard, can be removed from the platform in a matter of seconds, following a serious complaint from a passenger or the director. Through the technology, a cashless system, uh, using a credit card or a debit card of donation payments, can add convenience for passengers and safety for drivers who aren't holding cash. This is particularly important and something that I've experienced uh, myself um, twice in my three visits to Columbus recently. In fact, as recently as today, I've been told that there's a $10 minimum for credit card transactions here in town. Um, I understand that's not the case. You know, I've had $10 uh, receipts and $5 on the meter. Lyft's also been innovative in the insurance front, too. Uh, Lyft has worked with insurers, insurers to develop a hundred, or, sorry, to develop a one million dollar commercial automotive excess liability insurance policy that drops down to the first dollar if there's no coverage from the driver's personal policy, so, or if that policy is exhausted. So it acts as a full million dollar policy for liability. In addition, Lyft has obtained insurance for uninsured and underinsured uh, coverage and collision coverage for drivers. The benefits uh, of Lyft to the community increase as the number of drivers increase. The system gets faster, it gets more efficient as this community of drivers gets larger. As the number of drivers grows, coverage increases significantly and the areas that may be trouble spots for other forms of transportation become areas that are served by Lyft. We've seen this in other cities where the, the system is more mature. People live in those areas, people are happy to give rides in those areas. It's, and people are able to get rides in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of hours. This can only occur, however, if we create an easy way to bring on new drivers while maintaining the highest levels of safety. We feel that the current proposed rules are a great step forward and we very much appreciate that, but they don't quite accomplish it uh, yet. It, we look forward and we actually appreciate the opportunity to work with Columbus uh, going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Black. It's a pleasure to meet you. I have not had the opportunity to meet you. So um, I did have one question for you, if you could return to the podium. And the first question is kind of a silly question, though. You said in your last two experiences here at Columbus, you didn't use a Lyft vehicle or Uber vehicle? It was just a question. Yes. No, but, and that's okay. true. The first time they weren't operating. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I also wanted to ask you, I 
asked uh, Amanda Ford in regards to passengers existing in vehicles prior to taking on another passenger, such as a driver's child. Can you address that in terms of how your company regulates and monitors that children being in vehicles with other strangers? That's a concern I have. So if you could address that, I'd appreciate it. We have the same concern. It is a company policy that non-passengers, you know, would not be permitted. So it's the driver and the passengers. Now, there may be more than one passenger if you, requ you know, re requested a lift ride and had a couple of friends. The three of you could ride. You know, it's not limited to only one person, but there would be no non-passengers riding, you know, no ride-alongs, you might say, in the car. No, uh, you know, nobody riding shotgun, uh, if you know what I mean, uh, next to the driver. So it's, it is limited to the driver only. And that's a company policy. It's, I've seen some codes around the country that, that you know, address that, but it's something that we address in our company policy. Certain other things that we do that go beyond what uh, the policies are. We talked about a 21-year-old age. We require 23. I mean, it's, we just find it's, you know, the, if you look at the numbers, it's just much, much safer and safer. Safety is our number one concern. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. It certainly seems a reason to revoke a license in terms of having a non-passenger in the vehicle, particularly with children if someone is moonlighting oh, or something with, with this type of transportation and, and not necessarily just attempting to make extra money but still keeping children, can't go to school I, on a snow day, all of that, and they're still trying to can maintain a certain standard of earning. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Beck. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. John Mazza. Oh, okay, please correct me. Um, I learned that way, so if you'll please approach the podium, please share your first and last name, address, and any organization that you represent. Mr. Mazza, you have three minutes to share uh, your comments related to tonight's hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Mills. It is John Mazza. I'm with Mazza and Associates Mazza. LLC. Mm -hmm. uh, we're on uh, in Chatham Village, Chatham Lane, in the city of Columbus. I'm here representing the interests of the Independent Taxi Cab Association of Columbus, better known as ITAC, and submit these comments on its behalf. And I suspect that some of the comments and concerns also rest with other taxi cab owners and companies as well. Uh, I think it's essentially been conceded by the city that any adoption of the pr proposed code changes is premature at this time. There appears to be an assumption that Columbus has a need for the peer-to-peer -peer services, but there's been no empirical or source data presented which supports that such a need exists in Columbus. Maybe more livery service is needed in Pickerington, Grove City, Westerville. Is it needed here? There should be data that is accumulated that calls out for the need of these kind of services in, in the city. Certainly the prospect of arranging livery service digitally has merit, however, many of the taxi cab companies already in existence have or are currently in the process of converting to these digital and app systems. <clears throat> the insurance provisions of the proposed code, while appearing comprehensive on their face, are still in need of research and confirmation. Typically, personal lines automobile liability coverage, as required of the peer-to-peer -peer drivers, specifically excludes and does not cover incidents of potential liability either to customers or third parties where the vehicle is being operated for hire. Additionally, the coverage which appears to be required of the companies needs to be researched with the Department of Insurance and automobile, automobile liability carriers to confirm that coverage for independent contractors as the drivers are characterized in the code, because typical exclusions in such policy exist for non-owned vehicles. Such coverage may be available as contemplated in the proposed code, but this must be verified, including all exclusions and limitations which apply. The taxi cabs currently licensed and operating in the City of Columbus are subject to a maximum number or quota. There is no proposed maximum number or quota for the peer-to-peer -peer services. Allowing these services, while denying the existing taxi cab companies and operators to increase their numbers of taxi cabs available, creates an unfair competitive advantage for the peer-to-peer -peer companies and prejudices, if not discriminates, against the existing and licensed taxi cabs. Without even a maximum number of peer-to-peer -peer vehicles, the Columbus market will be flooded with vehicle for higher service. Additionally, the rate structures for the proposed service are not strictly set and thus can be arbitrarily changed at any time by these companies to ensure that they are at a lower 
rate than the taxi cabs, again, providing an unfair competitive advantage. PCI compliance for credit card use is very strict for taxi cabs, and I think it was admitted that there has not been inserted into the code, but has the city actually seen the certification of compliance from certifying companies? There is a process that, that is entered into that has to be uh, complied with. The limitation of these proposed services relate only to transportation arrangements in advance as opposed to picking passengers up on the curb has to be strictly enforced. Penalties must be severe, and this has been happening. And you will note the attendees here, most of whom are ITAC members, owning and operating taxi cabs <coughs> is their life and livelihood. These are not corporate giants operating in multiple cities. If the city does not adequately consider and protect these hardworking people, they will suffer irreparable financial adversity. Some, in summary, the legislation must be further analyzed by the city and opportunities afforded for further comment. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I have a few questions. Um, I just didn't want to make a few assumptions about a couple of your comments. You make comments related to the moratorium when you were talking about maximum number. Yes, there, there needs to be an opportunity to the existing taxicab numbers if, in fact, peer-to-peer -peer service is allowed for them to increase their taxicab service into the city as well. Oh, you're not suggesting limitation for peer-to-peer, -peer, but an opportunity to increase when it comes to taxi cabs. Well, you're, you need to limit... I'm asking what you're suggesting, please, yeah, if you Yeah, but could. my suggestion okay. is that you, you, you limit peer-to-peer -peer and correspondingly make open up in the same per rata share the availability to the existing taxi cab companies. Okay, and my next question on another comment that you made in related to the independent contractor insurance, can you share with me the insurance um, methodology and what's at place for the independent taxi cab? Could you talk a little bit about the insurance, for the independent how that works? Cabs? Mm -hmm, for your members. Yeah, the, the members have created a self-insured fund, and the self-insured fund is contributed to by the participants who are the, the owners of the cabs. And how does that work with an incident? Uh, an incident is made. There's a claim made. The claim is adjusted by staff at ITAC. And uh, if found that there is a merit to it, it is, it is paid. It is adjusted and paid. If it is like any other insurance company, if it does not have merit or the merit is questionable, it is contested. Okay. And, and the impact of the claim is felt by all members or by that just that one driver if oh, the claim is paid? It's an interesting point because there's a lawsuit right on that question. But uh, it is felt by all. The, it goes into what is called the loss prevention fund. Mm. And in the prevention fund, all of the members share and claims, expenses for defending claims, et cetera, come out of that fund. They are, all members are assessed the same amount on a monthly basis so that, uh, and, and it does happen sometimes, that you can have one operator or one company have a disproportionate amount of claims over time than some other operators, but they have chosen to operate in that way that they all will contribute. So one driver is having a, a tough year in terms of incidents. It's, it's what is in the self-insured pool is impacted by that one driver and all share that concern. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Our next driver, and I apologize because I should have learned uh, how to pronounce your name you have been uh, gracious enough to be a part of this discussion. Mr. Havitay? Havitay. Um, I apologize again. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Please re-pronounce your name correctly and your address and any organization that you represent. And, sir, you have three minutes to speak on tonight's topic of discussion. Uh, Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Michelle Mills, and thank you everybody uh, who attended this meeting today. My name is Haptai Okubazgi. <clears throat> I live in um, 
7880 Orange Station Loop, Lewis Center, Ohio. Um, today I represent the Independent Taxi Cab Association of Columbus. And uh, also um, I'm the president of that association currently. I also represent independent taxi cab owners in Columbus, um, the independent, less than 25. I represent them in the vehicle for hire board. <clears throat> The city uh, public safety department and the city vehicle for hire license section have been <clears throat> busy proposing code changes throughout 2013 and this year. Thank you, council member, for giving me this opportunity to express my concerns on this change. Number one, here I want to oppose the city's rush to accommodate application companies for the reason that they are only here. I believe before they operate here, the city of Columbus has to learn from its own sources, not from sources hired by other personals. It is good they, they come here, but throughout the, they have to respect the rules of the city and the state until they are told to do so are still working. Number two, the concern of public safety is of great importance. As presented in the proposal, this concern doesn't have a clear answer yet. Better not rush. We should learn what is happening in other cities. Cities and states throughout the United States are redoing what they did wrong on the first time. Number three, I believe Local government should take care of local businesses. In Columbus, we are very proud of the government of this great city that gives its residents and citizens the opportunity to live the American dream by owning their own businesses and employing themselves. The peer-to-peer -peer ad uh, advertisements, which sounds nice as a word, affects incomes of this existing taxi cab in the, uh, businesses. Number four, the new apps companies in Columbus wanted to make money without doing anything. They don't have to buy the vehicle. They don't, they don't have to have the responsibility for accident claims. They only wanted to make 20% of what driver makes by just taking the driver's customers from for many years through the, uh, the, the power of application. In conclusion, I would like to take my point, to make my point that easing regulations to the well-funded companies to crash the existing taxi cab companies who called Columbus home for many years is not fair. Thank you. Thank you, I have a couple questions. Um, and just to make sure that I understood your concerns and, and from yourself and as well as those that you represent, is uh, rushing to accommodate the new businesses what is a concern of yours, uh, their respect for the rules within the city and operating, um, their uh, taking of business from local businesses. Did I understand those concerns yes. so far? Okay. And may I ask a question? How long have you been in operation in the city of Columbus? For 21 years. 21 years. And in those 21 years, have you made any changes related to how you operate your business at all until these recent changes? Changes on what aspect? Car, accepting credit cards, updating the vehicle, any changes in terms of how you operate the cab. Any, anything that is regulated by the city of Columbus, we comply with that. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next speaker this evening is Mr. Mike Stenziano. Mr. Stenziano, if you please approach the podium, share your first and last name, your address, and any organizations that you represent. You have three minutes. 
Uh, good evening, uh, Chairperson Mills. I am Mike Stenziano, Senior Vice President of Government and Corporate Relations for Demotech Incorporated, uh, located at 2715 Teller Parkway here in uh, Dublin. Beginning in 1973, I had the honor of serving for 22 years representing the good people of Columbus in the Ohio General Assembly, where I chaired the House Insurance Committee for 16 years. I am a past president of the National Conference of Insurance Legislators and former chair of the Industry Education Council to NCOIL. Demotech, which I mentioned is based here in Dublin, is a financial analysis firm serving consumers, regulators, legislators, and the property casualty insurance industry across the country for the past 29 years. Joe Petrelli, Demotech's founder and president, is also here this evening. We commend the diligent work of city officials, council members, and their staffs in seeking protection for the health, safety, and well-being of the public by pursuing regulation of insurance and other requirements ap applicable to currently unregulated transportation entities here in Columbus. The promise of an insurance policy to pay for losses incurred by innocent victims is only as good as the financial ability of the insurance company issuing the policy to pay claims. To assure the solvency and the ability to pay claims, of insurers writing the ins liability insurance your proposed regulations require. Many jurisdictions around the country impose licensing and rating requirements on the insurer providing the coverage. I respectfully suggest that the consumer protections that you are seeking to establish will be considerably strengthened by requiring that only those highly rated insurance entities licensed or otherwise authorized or permitted by the Ohio Department of Insurance to do business in Ohio be allowed to provide the liability protections required by your proposed regulations. You can accomplish this by including uh, the following language in section 588.17, liability protection required. All liability insurance required under this section must be issued by an insurer duly licensed or otherwise authorized or permitted to transact such business in the state of Ohio with a rating of no less than A- minus from AM Best or A from Demotech. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify this evening. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them now. Thank you, Mr. Stenziano. I don't have any questions for you. Um, I believe that um, our discussions going forward has always been in terms of how do we work with changes related to insurance, beginning with the first changes we made uh, some time ago, and I committed to ensuring that we continue to address the issue of insurance because of the protection of our citizens. So thank you for your comments. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suleiman Gabriel. Sir, if you please approach the podium, please pronounce your name correctly and share your first and last name and any organizations that you may represent. Uh, you have three minutes. Again, you did a good job. I don't have to pronounce again. You pronounce well. Uh, my name is Salman Gabriel. Uh, I represent the independent taxi cab uh, owners and myself. Uh, my address is 3463 Halpern Street, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, good evening uh, to the City Council, uh, Ms. Michelle Mills, and the uh, Department of Safety and Transportation, especially Amanda and Ms. Ramona, as uh, they are really the asset for this organization. Uh, my name is Solomon Gabriel. I have uh, been driven taxi for the last 30 years. And I came here tonight to represent myself and other taxi owners. Tonight, we gather here in front of you to demonstrate, to oppose, to the unfair advantage given to peer-to-peer -to -peer is offered by the city of Columbus. 
peer-to-peer, -peer, never served with Columbus publics and guests. They don't know Columbus like we do. At one point, we were the ambassadors of the city. And as we grew and improved with our city, we, no long, uh, we long time Columbus business owners continue to get cut at our knees. While regulations and tightening for independent taxi companies, opportunities are opening up to giant companies like peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. As this happens, our retirements, our 401ks, our bread and butter to the unknown guest big companies. If the city of Columbus and you no longer find our service to the community necessary, tell us our votes and input no longer have value to the mayor and mayor's office and the city governor. Tell us the old and senior citizens will tweet, text, and email for cabs, and that they will find services that will volunteer to take them to polling stations to vote government officials. Tell us to seek our employment. Tell us to go to jobs and family service. Tell us to apply for welfare. Tell us our population, men and women, of lower and middle class minority and underrepresented foreign background will be cut down yet another way. Tell us to stop seeking upward mobilities. Tell us, are, are, <coughs> tell us you are just better off without us. We have been open and active in our relationship with the city, so we hope representatives of the city can be the same. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your comments. If you would help me just a bit before you leave the podium and share with me of the proposed changes, what would you say are your major concerns? For the independent? You yourself. You shared some comments that talked about this being an un unfair advantage, being cut off at your knees, um, no longer feeling valued, Tell me what are your major concerns that uh, have you suggest that this is what the proposed changes will yeah, in 30 years, result in? 30 years experience, when we need transportation to the city of Columbus, the city of Columbus and mayor's office, as they make ad hoc committee with VHP vehicles for hire board, and they used to add licenses or they cut license or they put moratorium. If if we can accommodate what the peers to peers can do to the city of Columbus, we believe, I believe we should get the first advantage, we should get the first notice, we should get the first information. That is a disadvantage we have. And also when we came here first time, you told us in 30 years time they didn't change the rules and regulations and codes and we just cooperate with you even though we had some differences, insurance and you know, age of, age of a car and uh, you know, fee, fee goes about 150% up. And so with, this, with the economy and gas price and everything, you know, we weren't pleased, but we always follow your order and we cooperate. But um, our biggest, Complaint is, if we can do the business, if we can do what peers to peers can do, we should get, while when we are serving 30 and 40 and 50 years here in the city of this beautiful city, we should get the advantage first. We should get the priority first. That is my main complaint. And share with me what does that look like in terms of the advantage? We will see of the outcome, uh, we are going to serve better, we are going to compete uh, better as much as possible with any person who is coming. We are not going to move out. We don't have a place to move out. We chose to stay here. We are going to compete, but it doesn't really look right. Uh, I mean, we should get the, 
the advantage first. Okay, if, if, if not this evening, if you could share uh, with my office what that looks like. I'm hearing your concerns, but I'm trying to match what you're sharing with me to what are the, the concerns you have with the proposed changes, and that's what I'm not hearing. So I, I'd ask um, not tonight so that I can move to the other speakers who've taken the time to come and be heard this evening, but if you could share, me, share with me what are your concerns on the code changes, I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you okay. so much. Our next speaker is Jessica Miller. Ms. Miller, if you would please approach the podium, share your first and last name and address in any organizations you may represent. You have three minutes to share your comments related to tonight's peer-to-peer -to -peer transportation hearing. Thank you, Councilmember Mills. My name is Jessica Miller. I live at 1720 Ashland Avenue in Columbus. That's 43212. I'm representing no organizations. I'm here as a private citizen. Um, a while back, back in December, I visited Chicago, Illinois for a long weekend. After many poor experiences with taxi services all over the country, my friends and I decided to try a new sharing, um, sharing service called Lyft. Um, it's simple and easy to use. It allows users, I mean, everyone's already heard all of this, but it allows users to request a ride from the network of drivers to be taken to their desired location while all donations, payment transactions, contact with the driver, and rating to their, um, rating their experience is done through the app. So it ensures my privacy as a user. The drivers must also follow the route calculated by the application to ensure the user is taken to the preferred destination as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible. We use Lyft the entire weekend. With the City of Columbus, while the City of Columbus is a forward-thinking community, we have numerous options for modern alternative transportation. I feel the people living, working, and visiting here would greatly benefit from the provisions proposed in tonight's Vehicle for Hire Code. In my opinion, our current alternative transportation choices fall short of the service I desire as a young professional working and, playing here, working and living here in Columbus. My family chooses to only have one car for a variety of reasons, environmental, financial, among others. Kogo and car to go home zones don't reach my neighborhood, and I don't feel safe in the taxi or the coda alone. While those are great options for some in our city, I feel it's fair and warranted to allow for more selection. Uber and Lyft have been offering free rides to Pioneer users for the past two weeks. I have taken both of them many times. <laughs> The experience has been fantastic. Their drivers are friendly, they're knowledgeable of our city, and I feel very safe. I absolutely feel these new companies should be welcomed into our smart and open community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. I just have one question. Um, as you've heard me share, I'm not sure how much of the hearing you've heard, but the consumer protection and safety is my feature, and you mentioned it several times in your testimony. Can you tell me what about the peer-to-peer -peer network transportation increases your sense of safety over the other modes of transportation? Because I am very um, pessimistic and I'm a researcher at heart. I've done extensive research on both Lyft and Uber as far as the consumer um, safety. I love being able to see the driver's picture and the vehicle that they're driving because I can see that they, like I can see who's coming to get me. I can see instead of just hailing someone off the side of the road where I don't know um, necessarily that they have been, I, I don't personally have that assurance that they've been vetted like I know that the Lyft and Uber drivers have been because they're drivers of that company. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Sorry. Thanks. Our next speaker this evening is David Herring. Mr. Herring, if you please approach the podium. Please share your first and last name and any organizations that you may represent. Mr. Herring, you have three minutes to share your comments related to tonight's hearing. Thank you. How's it going? My name is David Herring. I live at 3422 Burbank, Columbus, Ohio. I've lived here for 27 years now. I moved here from Florida, started going to college here, and graduated and moved into going to working for a cab company. Been there for 25 years now, absolutely love it. It's changed my life, grown with it, raised five kids, got six grandchildren. I don't want to see that disappear. The proposals that they're bringing up are for a business 
that is nothing more than internet hitchhiking. These guys, they're just now coming around the rules and regulations. They're already operating without paying attention to any rules and regulations. The uh, seat on the vehicle for hire board shouldn't be open for someone that doesn't care about our rules, our regulations, or our codes. That was me at the vehicle for hire board meeting that said that they shouldn't have a representative. If you operate and give away free rides to transportation, that's directly impacting us. It's directly, directly costing us business, customers, and money. This is an unfair business practice to me from a company that hasn't even been licensed for the city of Columbus yet. And to operate already without any licensing or any, any care of our rules or regulations to me just shows how much they really care about our community. That's all I have to say, ma'am. Thank you, Mr. Harry. I do have, a, tell me again how long you've been in operation. I've been, the company that I work for has been in operation for 28 years. I started to work. They were in their house working out of their garage with five cars. And during that 20 years, I'm going to ask you a question I asked the speaker earlier. Um, we've just underwent a lot of changes related to vehicle for hire. Prior to those changes, have there been any changes that you have made in terms of how the businesses operate outside of the changes that we've proposed? Uh, there's always been changes. The way that, that people, just like GPSs. When I first started driving, everybody had to have a map book. GPSs come along, we had to do GPSs. When we first started, there wasn't even cell phones. You had, if you wanted personal calls, you had to take them off a pager. All right, and then cell phones came along, and we've upgraded with all these things. We've put computers in the cabs. We've put credit card machines in the cabs. We've gone to electronic dispatching. We have our own apps. They're, they're not providing a new service. They've just found a new name for the same service that we're already providing. Thank you, Mr. Herring. Thank you. If the members in the audience would be so kind to ensure that everyone is heard by silencing your cell phones. I want to make sure that I hear everyone. If you need to leave chambers, please do so. It is important that I hear the disruption of the cell phones makes it difficult, and I think this is one of the most important portions of tonight's hearing, and that is the public testimony. I believe we've heard from the next speaker. I think he wanted to make sure he was heard. He filled out two speaker slips. Mr. Mazza? He's filled out two. Our next speaker is Lester Coleman. Mr. Coleman, if you will please approach the podium. Share your first and last name and address in any organizations you may represent. You have three minutes to share your comments related to peer-to-peer -peer transportation. My name is Lester Coleman. I've been in this business now for 32 years. I live at 2200 Walford Lane. I've seen the changes in this industry go from uh, complete voice dispatching to different technologies. I've also witnessed this city continually let different aspects come in and take away from the cab ministries. And some of the things that really concern me is that here you've got a company that says we use algorithms. Here you've got a company that says we use algorithms. There is no set fee for what the time is. There is no set fee for what the distance is. And in the taxi industry, we have to go and collect sales tax. There is no set tax rate for them. We have to have a vendor's license. It just surprises me that you let somebody go and pop up in business, do business without being regulated. Now they're working on regulation standards. And everything that we have to adhere to in the taxi industry is just being pushed aside. We have cameras in our vehicles now that go and uh, videotape anything, so the safety of the people are a factor. Yellow Cab and Acme Cab, which I'm employed by, have... Uh, I want to make sure that not only myself, but our viewing audience can hear you, if you please. Uh, there you go. Okay. Speak closer to the microphone. I not want to make sure you're heard and captured. Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Not only do we have cameras inside of all the taxi cabs, at uh, Acme Cab and Yellow Cab, that record everything that happens on a daily basis, so safety's not a factor. We're recorded, we're licensed through the city. 
So I'd just like to know how these people can come in here without any regulation, without any real uh, rates at which they charge. They say that you, you have to go by a specific uh, route for the calculation of rates. If you've ever been in a taxi cab, you've had people say, well, I need to stop here for 10 minutes. Okay, I need to go run into the store, get a, uh, get a gallon of milk or something. They run in, they go out, or they want to go pick up a friend. How are they going to go and regulate that as far as uh, the rates that they're charging? I have not come to anything that I've seen that shows what the rates is for time or distance. So there is no competition. We have no regulation. We have no rates. We have no vendor's license that they have to go and adhere to. In the taxi industry, we have to collect sales tax and send it in. Why does this, these people not have to? They're doing the same thing. It is vehicle for hire. That's it. Okay, I don't like to take up any of your three minutes, so I want to make sure you are finished. Your concerns are how the fares are regulated, the tax right. implications of the uh, potential drivers for Lyft, and your other concern is, um, I want to make sure I got it, their ability to operate without regulation. That's you right, they've done concern. it. Did I, I miss mean, any concern, Mr. Coleman, did I miss yes. any of your concerns? Yes. I did, what did I miss? No, no, oh. you're right. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Coleman, for okay. taking your time. I appreciate it. Our next speaker is Mr. Adam Jones. Mr. Jones, if you please approach the podium, share your first and last name and any organizations that you represent Please uh, share your comments within three minutes related to tonight's hearing. Okay. My name is Adam Jones. I live at 390 Broadmeadows Boulevard here in Columbus, Ohio, and I'm a private citizen. Okay. Well, um, I'm speaking on behalf of Uber, and I rely on public transportation for anything I do because I have a disability and I cannot drive because I have epilepsy, and I feel very safe with Uber because they do a background check on both me and the driver. And when they pick you up, you can see who the person is because they send you the picture and you get a text message telling you that they're coming. And it's just, I don't feel very safe with the other taxi cab companies or on Kodo. Um, and it's just, uh, Taxi cab companies talk on their cell phones and they text all the time and with Uber they're not allowed to do that. And one time when I got a try well when I tried to get a cab at Kroger, I had to wait two hours for the taxi to come and they didn't even end up showing up. A person saw me standing outside both when they came in and they actually offered me a ride when they came out. So I just ended up going with this complete stranger. And uh, let's see, what else? And the live access with the uh, Uber's cell phone uh, just makes me feel very safe in case I end up having a seizure in the car. And there's just so many things that make me feel very happy about Uber. I've ridden with them like seven different times and the drivers are all very friendly, and I mean, you just don't even end up talking to the drivers when with the other taxis. And let's see, what else is there? They're much faster. I mean, I've had them show up within just one or two minutes. And let's see, here, what else is there? Well, I 
Lyft isn't even in town yet, so I haven't written with them. Uh, well, do you have any questions? <laughs> I don't want to interrupt your time, but if you're finished, I, I do finished. have a couple questions. Okay, what is you're it? You're finished? Yeah. So again, as I mentioned earlier, consumer protection and safety is one mm -hmm. of my main concerns. And I heard you mention a safety related mm -hmm. to your experience with Uber. I, I'm wondering if your uh, experiences or past experiences with the taxi cabs is a part of your sense of safety with Uber related because mm -hmm. you sound like you've had some experiences with taxi cabs. Yes, very that, much. That uh, seems to have been not so pleasant as you have had with mm -hmm. Uber. Right, that's very true. And you alluded to the safety features connected to the ability to yes. see the photo. Yes, you, well, when you um, get a, when they tell you they're coming to pick you up, you actually get a image, whoops, an image of the driver so you can see who's actually picking you up. And then they also have that uh, ooh in their window so you can tell exactly who the person is coming to pick you up, and you get a text message that says how long it's going to be till they get there, and then when the driver pulls up, it says your name, and then it says your Uber is arriving. So your, your sense of safety is based on the amount of technology that is used with right. this particular Very transportation. True. Yeah. Okay, so if, if that same level of technology existed with a taxi cab, do you imagine your safety would be the same? Um, possibly. And, mm -hmm. be, well, um, with my insurance, um, I get transportation from other taxis, but I've even had some of the taxi cabs not even have, uh, like, the name of the taxi on the side of it, so I can't even tell who, them when they've pulled up. Some of them have it, but not all of them. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, you are certainly um, one of the reasons why some of the changes we made to TaxiCast for the experiences that we're trying to create for not only yourself as a citizen in our great city, but also our visitors so that we can have that kind of experience mm -hmm. and sense of safety when folks are visiting our city and experiencing alternative modes of transportation. Thank you. Thank you for coming down. Our next speaker is Norma Whiteside. Ms. Whiteside, if you would please approach the podium, share your first and last name and address and any organizations you may represent. Ms. Whiteside, you have three minutes to speak on tonight's hearing related to peer-to-peer -peer transportation. Hi, my name is Norma Whiteside. I live at 1320. One Millstone Drive, Marysville, Ohio, 43040. I am currently a Uber driver. Uh, the reason I chose to drive for Uber is because I do believe in fair enterprise. I do believe that uh, Uber is offering something that the city of Columbus desperately needs. They're, they're offering uh, the people in Columbus an opportunity to choose who they want for a uh, for a driver or who they want to do business with. And I think that competition is a very good thing and it makes it, uh, it, it competition is good for everybody. It's good for the consumer, it's good for the employer, it's good for the employee, it's good for everybody. And Uber has a lot of extremely strict regulations. And if you break the regulations, they do not keep you. And we are not allowed to talk on a cell phone we're not allowed to text while we're driving. We're not allowed to have anybody in the car with us except for the client that we are picking up. Um, I, I drive a lot of females around and the females like me because they say that they feel more comfortable with a female driver. And when I take, I do a lot of college kids and when I take the college kids back home after they've been out for the night, not only do I drop them off, I stay and wait and make sure they get in their house safely, which I've talked to some other Uber drivers and they do the same thing. When I pull up to pick somebody up, I turn on my flashing lights so there's no guessing game as to what car they're getting into. I tell them that my flashing lights are on. I do have the Uber decal in the window. Uh, they can see my picture. And when I get there, I press a little button that says I have arrived and then they get a message that I'm outside. 
And if they don't come out within five minutes or so, I do call them and let them know I'm out there. And if they ask me to, I'll wait for them. And if they tell me they've changed their mind, we'll just cancel the trip and there's no hard feelings. And the, uh, the girls are really happy because they say that most guys that drop them off, especially um, non-Uber um, drivers, don't wait till they get in the house. They just drop them off and leave. That's all I have to say. Okay, I did not want to interrupt your time to speak. Thank you for sharing your comments. Okay, okay. thank you. Our next speaker is Sean McKee. Mr. McKee, if you would please approach the podium, share your first and last name and any organizations you may represent. And while you're approaching the podium, I'm going to give notice to James Andre that you are next uh, in order to speak. So if you could make your way close to the podium. Mr. McKee, please share your first and last name, address, and any organizations you may represent. You have three minutes to share on the topic of tonight's hearing. Yes, uh, Sean McKee, 1799 West Fifth Avenue, Columbus, uh, representing Uber as a driver and a rider. Uh, I don't have any prepared remarks because they just asked me this afternoon to come up, but uh, I was glad to show up and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you. Um, as a driver, um, this concept has been very well received. I've probably given over 200 rides and it's been nothing but um, you know, praise and, and uh, just very, you know, people are very excited to have the services in the uh, Columbus area. A lot of the professionals that ride with us uh, come, you know, they ride in other cities as well. Uh, big cities around the United States and really throughout the world and they are just excited that the same services they can get in the bigger cities, Chicago, New York, uh, Dallas, San Francisco are here. Now in Columbus, it really brings Columbus uh, you know, on par with these other big cities and the services that they can uh, access while they're here. Um, it's quick, it's clean, it's efficient, um, it's safe. Um, and as a rider, um, all, those, all those ideas uh, apply as well. I feel safe, I feel you know, it's efficient, it's uh, clean, people are nice. It's just been a great experience uh, on both sides of uh, being a rider and a driver. Um, it's a good chance to really for me to bring in some revenue. I own my own company and I drive around the city quite a bit. And I have a lot of time between clients, uh, sometimes two or three hours, sometimes I'll see a client in the morning and I won't see another one till the evening. And I've got all this time on my hands and it l lets me keep revenue coming into my business um, and help you know, pay for gas and, and you know, the overhead that's involved with uh, driving around the city. Um, I do drive in some other cities as well because I have clients that I see in the Detroit area and in Chicago. And again, it gives me the opportunity to bring in revenue um, when I'm in those cities as well. So I think it's a great uh, service. And um, I think after all the kinks are worked out, I think everybody's gonna be happy. I think competition's good. And it's forcing the uh, traditional cab services to take a look at their business model. And I think uh, in the end, everybody's gonna be better off. And um, I think that's it, thank you. Do you have any questions? I do have a question, and on the same lines that I've asked some of the other speakers, you mentioned a key word to a lot of this, and that's the safety aspect. Tell me, as a driver, what do you feel are the features of what you're offering that creates a sense of safety that is different than a taxi cab experience? Well, for me personally, I mean, I, I, you know, I've got a nice car, and you know, I've, I'm a five, I get a lot of you know, five-star ratings from my riders, and you know, I can only speak for myself, but riders, um, you know, they enjoy my car. It's, it's nice, it's clean, they feel safe with me driving. I talk to them. Um, you know, I've had a lot of comments. People tell me I'm very personable, and they just enjoy riding with me, and they, they say it's a good experience. Um, you know, as far as riders are concerned, you know, you'd have to ask them why they feel safe, but uh, I'm sure there's a, a number of different reasons. Um, but I just, you know, people are very, very excited about uh, the service of Uber and, and the Lyft. And again, I think it's a great thing for Columbus. It really brings us up on par, you know, with the other big cities in the United States, which is what Columbus wants. And um, it's, it's been great. So. I wanted to ask you as a driver differently than I've asked some of the other passengers that have spoke this evening on tonight's hearing. 
because of the comments made towards safety. And I just want to make sure that we provide and educate the audience here tonight and also the viewing audience about our regulations of taxi cabs. It requires a lot and then some in terms of safety. So I just don't want to give the impression that our taxi cabs are operating and they don't go through background checks and some of the other things that um, are also offered through some of the other alternative transportation sure. modes mm -hmm. that we do have strong taxi cab regulations. There are background checks, there are requirements for cleanliness upkeep of cabs, some of the change we've made to ensure that so we do have that in place as a city. I just want to make sure that that thought does not continue to exacerbate through the, the thoughts of everyone about the taxi cabs and, and how they're operating. Sure. Okay, thank you for sure. sharing thank your you. comments. Mm -hmm. Mr. Andre, if you please approach the podium, share your first and last name, your address, and any organizations that you may represent. And please uh, pronounce your name correctly if I've done so incorrectly. You have three minutes to share your comments related to uh, the topic this evening. You got the name right, uh, James Andre. I'm the general manager for Uber Ohio. Uh, I live at 20, 20 East Hubbard here in Columbus, 43215. Am I too close to this? Okay, there we go. Um, I just wanna to speak tonight a little bit about something you've mentioned you know, several times, which is um, you know, the consumer and, and paying attention to those safety needs and also um, you know, what they've asked for uh, as far as transportation. And I think when you look at companies like Uber, and you gotta remember Uber is, is really all about transportation choice. We think that's a good thing for people that wanna move around their city, whether that be uh, by hailing a taxi on the street, taking the bus, or using um, an app company like Uber to get that ride. Ultimately, I think it's a consumer that wins in that situation. We talked a little bit about uh, competition and such. You know, Uber's really a, a, a two-sided marketplace, and I think that's interesting because it's bringing efficiency um, you know, to the transportation system here in Columbus and 80 other cities in which we operate. Um, you know, I talked about transportation choice, just to be clear. Um, depending on the market, you can open up the Uber app and you can sort of pick different ways that you'd like to move around your city, whether that be um, you know, Uber Black, which partnerships with limousine operators, SUV, uh, we have an Uber Lux product in a few cities, and of course UberX, which we're discussing um, tonight. You know, I think what consumers want, though, are the things that you know, maybe they weren't getting before, and that's you know, reliability, convenience, hassle-free payments, uh, affordability, all those things I think they're, they're getting by being able to connect uh, with these transportation providers by using Uber or other similar app companies. Um, and if you look at all the issues that you know, we're sort of tackling that are out there that I think are really important for the city to, to look at you know, everything from tourism and visitors and, and drinking and driving issues with which I've heard a ton of, you know, before Uber was in town, people would drink, they would drive and you know, they no longer do that. You know, parking issues around Short North and campus, uh, people are saying they're giving up their cars now because they can count on the reliability you know, of these, these um, app companies. And if you look around, you know, just the Midwest in general, places where UberX and ride sharing has already, you know, been flourishing, places like Indianapolis, Detroit, Oklahoma City, Chicago, Pittsburgh, St. Paul, you know, the list goes on. Um, I think this is really something that, you know, is important to people. And just, you know, before the time wraps up here, from a safety perspective, I just want to touch on one thing. You know, we talked about this two-sided marketplace, and when people take rides using Uber, they have that ability to give feedback to us. They have the ability to rate their driver. They have the ability to comment on their experience. You know, the other options they have, whether that be taxi or something else, you know, who does a rider call? Who, you know, who do they get in contact with, the city, the company? You know, with, with Uber, it's a quick reply to your receipt. Um, we have an operations team based locally that immediately, you know, that's what they handle, talk to both sides of the equation and, you know, straighten it out. So I think that's one of the reasons people really feel good about it on top of all the you know expanded expanded background checks the commercial insurance you know that we have on top of um, the driver's policy etc thank you mr. Andre it's a pleasure to meet you um, I did have a few questions for you and just a point of note there is opportunity in our cabs for individuals to issue complaints I just want to make sure in tonight's testimony from all of our speakers that there is not any thinking about 
no regulations. These things don't exist with taxi cabs. They are probably highlighted features for what the other companies offer, but these type of modes of complaints, we do have a method of which an individual can complain regarding a taxi cab. It does exist for them as well. I uh, understand it may be a different method of how that's handled with your business, but it does still exist with the taxi cab. So just want to make sure our consumers, when making choices about transportation, understand that these features exist within the taxi company as well. I had a question about um, in other cities that you may operate, have you reached out or made any engagement with any of the existing taxi cabs and any unique or innovative ways of partnering with that existing industry? Uh, yes, uh, in fact, in, in many of the markets in which we operate, mostly the major metropolitan um, U.S. markets, we actually partner with um, taxi operators as well. So, you know, I talked about that transportation choice. And so if you're in the city of Chicago, for example, um, you have the ability to open your Uber app. And I think there's literally four or five choices to move around the city. Taxi is one of them. So you'll connect directly with a city taxi um, as sort of a booking tool for the Uber app. So people love that convenience of pushing a button in three or four minutes. I think the average pickup time in Chicago is less than three minutes, which is amazing. Um, so, you know, we certainly are open to, you know, working with providers on our system. Um, and, and in Chicago, you know, they have UberX, they have SUV, they have Uber Black, and they have Taxi. And people choose, you know, many of them using different, you know, one day I'm going on a date, I take Uber Black because I want to have it nice. Next day, I, you know, it's just me and I want to be real cheap that day, so I'm going to take UberX. Um, and the next day, I'm going to go golf with my buddies and I need room for our club, so I pick Uber SUV. So I think you'll see Uber's platform continue to evolve in giving people that choice in the way that they're able to request transportation. And I think that's ultimately going to be how everybody wins. And, you know, on the flip side of the equation, I sort of ran out of time, so I won't dwell on it, but, you know, the partner drivers that can work on Uber's system, you know, everyone from uh, the part-timers, those with two jobs, those with no jobs, you know, everyone from teachers to mortgage brokers to uh, there was a drummer in a band that worked on Uber. And all these folks are now sort of either, you know, making ends meet or going above and beyond with this system um, and are getting a lot of pleasure out of meeting people in the city. So I think it's, it's really fun to be a part of when we can sort of sit in the middle of that as Uber and connect, you know, riders and drivers um, and have the, such benefits for both parties and also for the city in general. And have you reached out to the existing, um, whether it's the independent, the Acme, Yellow Cab, or any other operator, operating taxi cab industry, have you reached out to them at all? Um, I haven't reached out personally. There was some real brief initial discussion when we talked about coming to the market, you know, if there was opportunity to partner. I think we always stay open for that. I think ultimately... Um, you know, I have a small team that works with me to try to get this going and resources. Uh, we started with Uber Black. We did that for months um, and sort of we've, we've expanded for there. Um, you know, and I think this UberX uh, partnerships for Uber give right now the best con customer experience that I think ultimately the people are looking for and have asked us. You know, Uber is a tech company, so we've got a ton of data. I think someone mentioned that earlier tonight. And, you know, ultimately we chose to come to Columbus and there was a reason for that and that was the amount of people that had downloaded the app, the amount of people that had opened it up and tried to get a ride before we were even in town, the folks that write us emails every day about how good a service it is and so glad they're here, um, the contacts we get on Twitter, you know, it's just, it, it's fun to see that come in and, and have an outpouring in an industry that typically, um, you know, the, you don't normally get that. Well, I thought you came because it was a great city. Absolutely. Okay, it's a great thank city. You. you know, in fact, I'm actually, uh, you know, I'm from Ohio. Um, I've worked for Uber for a few years and used to run our market in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And uh, when, I, when I knew the option was to bring this type of service to Ohio, be closer to family and have a local team here that I could manage, uh, you know, I threw my hat in the ring for that and, and moved back and um, love Columbus. And I think the city's got a ton going for it. You look at some of the stuff that's potentially coming, conventions, all-star games, et cetera. These are even the Arnold last weekend. Um, these are folks that come into town that have used Uber in all these cities across the world and love that they can flick open the same app and now get a ride in whatever method, you know, they want to take. And so I think that does... It's a huge stamp of approval for, for Columbus, and I think it's going to take us as a city even to the next level, and that's awesome to be a part of. And Columbus is a great city again, right? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Andre. Thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Daniel Allman. 
Mr. Allman, if you'll please approach the podium, share your first and last name, and please uh, pronounce it correctly if I have done so incorrectly. Share your first and last name. Don't see Mr. Oh, oh there you are. Mr. Allman, you have three minutes to share your comments related to tonight's hearing. Thank you very much, Ms. Mills. My name is Dan Allman. I am the claims manager for the Independent Taxi Cab Association of Columbus. I do have a couple of comments to make on what's been previous. In my 18 months in this position, I've yet to have a customer come in and say that they've been shot, spit on, beat up, or thrown out of a taxi. So I think the safety issue is a bunch of BS. Now we can get down to my discussion. Um, I didn't hear much mentioned about the insurance. And I'm sure, I'd love to know how peer-to-peer -peer is going to handle it because there was somebody that died in one of their vehicles in San Francisco whose the peer driver's insurance company said, we don't cover it. He's using it for commercial purposes. And the peer company is saying, oh, he's supposed to have the coverage. We don't cover it. I think we got to make sure if you're going to let these people come in, make sure they got the insurance coverage. I think the second thing is, um, I can tell you that in 30 years of insurance experience, that most insurance companies will not cover for commercial use unless you pay for the commercial use. So I think the people that are driving for these people, and apparently they are getting paid. Uh, that gentleman said he was making quite a bit of money doing it. So they're not doing it for free as they've told us. Um, the second thing that I'd like to bring up is how come these people were able to come in without any authority, licensing, or control, and just start servicing in our industry. You know, um, they've never paid a penny worth tax as far as I know in the state of Ohio. Sales, income tax, or anything. They're from some other city coming in trying to take over an industry in this city. I don't think that's right. You've got a lot of drivers in this town that depend on the taxi industry to feed their families. And I think we should take a very strong look at that. I'm done. Thank you for your comments. And I did have a few comments to share with you and just to make sure I understood. Your concerns are in insurance and also um, particularly related to proof of commercial use of insurance, which I believe we covered in the proposed code that there is a requirement to show proof so that people are not uh, using the car and not having it insured in terms of commercial use. I also wanted to uh, share with you that we do have quite a few drivers and part of the vehicle for higher changes, so they don't always appear that way um, from the changes we made along the way have been to increase the use of the cabs by increasing their ability to compete and be ready for consumers, visitors as the city continues to grow, making sure that our visitors can use credit cards and things like that, dates of cab, cleanliness, all of those changes that we're insisting upon is so that when I have an, a one experience with a taxi cab that I'll go back again because of that one experience 
photos are placed in the proper areas. I can see who they are. I can complain if I have an issue. I can uh, get the name, license number, all of that of the driver. And so some of these changes, initially I know that they didn't feel good, but they are in fact the way that we can ensure that there is ability for those businesses to continue to thrive in our city. In addition to that, all of the support and financial uh, means that we're allowing for our visitors bureau to thrive and bring conventions and business to the city is so that all of our local businesses can thrive. All of these changes are absolutely to benefit the greater citizenry of the city of Columbus. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate you coming down. Our next speaker is Tom Barrett. Mr. Barrett, if you'll please approach the podium, share your first and last name and any organizations that you may represent. My name, is, my name is Tom Barrett, and I live at 4001 Sylvaner, Columbus, Ohio. I am an Uber driver, been driving with Uber for two weeks. Everybody that gets into my car absolutely enjoys it, just loves the fact that it's an app, that they can order it. They know when I'm going to arrive at their home. When I do arrive at their home, they receive a text message letting, me, letting them know that I'm outside. And if, if they don't come out within like five or 10 minutes, I'm able to call them. They have my number. I have their number. And everyone just loves it. Everyone. And uh, some of them do have reservations with the, t the taxi services. I, I don't want to go into that. But they like our service. And they just, they just love the fact that they can see me coming on the app. They can see me coming across town or wherever. And they can see how far away I am. And I think, you know, you, know, you don't want... And, and with the free market system, you don't want just one hamburger place in town to go to. You want several. And if you provide a good service and quality to somebody, they're going to want your service. And I think that's what, what it's all about. If you provide something that people want and need and they like it and they like you, I think it should be available. And that's, that's my only thing I've got to say about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Baird. Appreciate you sharing your comments. I believe our last speaker for the evening. I uh, don't see any other speaker slips. Mr. Jeff Cates. Mr. Cates, if you will please approach the podium, share your first and last name and address and any organizations that you may represent. Mr. Cates, you have three minutes to speak on tonight's uh, proposed code changes regarding peer to peer transportation. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. It's always a pleasure seeing you, Michelle, um, Councilwoman Mills. And I have a great deal of respect and appreciate all the hard work uh, that the Department of Public Safety does, Director Brown, um, Amanda, and Ramona. How would you forget my name? I was going with last name, Ford. I understand. It's okay. Mr. Cates, you have three minutes. Just a reminder. Okay. Thanks for the opportunity uh, to address City Council. The City of Columbus is working hard to offer the safest and best transportation service to the citizens and visitors of Columbus. As President of Yellow Cab, I want to let you know we, what we have done to address these needs and what more has to be done to support our growing city. Yellow Cab of Columbus is a forward-thinking company on the cutting edge of technology. Our fleet of 139 vehicles are equipped with backseat credit card processing equipment, GPS-based dispatching, cameras for driver and passenger safety. Our fleet of vehicles includes 38, uh, 36 alternative powered green vehicles, as well as 10 handicap accessible taxis. When it comes to on-demand and pre-arranged transportation options, we offer a full range of payment options including cash, credit card, debit card, accounts, and prepaid taxi cards. Yellow Cab has been offering an app for smartphone service for the last two years. This is all done with properly licensed and trained drivers and a call center staff 24-7, 365. There are two areas we, want, we know need further attention by the city in regards to public safety. Proper insurance coverage for these new companies. The suggestion in yesterday's vehicle for hire meeting to get a letter from an insurance company to document the driver is operating a commercial vehicle with personal insurance is not good enough. A rider or addendum to the policy should be required for proper documentation. Stricter penalties for operators um, operating outside the rules. We currently only have four hardworking enforcement officers to regulate over 600 vehicles. Because public safety is at risk, 
stricter penalties are required for those breaking city rules. License officers need the authority to impound vehicles for 60 days when unlicensed drivers or vehicles are caught putting our citizens and visitors in harm's way. The industry is working hard to get more vehicles on the street to meet growing demand. In the past year, Columbus has added 30 wheelchair vehicles, more than 70 other on-demand vehicles. This is a 17% increase in the number of um, vehicles licensed servicing our city. There's still more room for growth. Columbus should add another 50 taxi licenses to further improve our service. This would give Columbus 25% more vehicles on the street than just than a year ago. Let's cap the number of new vehicles before flooding the market with open-ended entrance. The city has mentioned an independent study be performed which can help make sure these approaches meet Columbus's needs. Competition is good for all. The taxi industry has been servicing Columbus for decades. We're asking the city to keep competition on a level playing field. The new code changes being suggested will allow for less regulated vehicles with a much lower operating cost to enter the market. This puts the current taxi industry at a disadvantage to compete fairly. Thank you, Mr. Cates. I just want to make sure I understood your comments clearly in regards to insurance coverage, um, notwithstanding uh, what's in the proposed code, but requiring a rider and an addendum to indicate the commercial insurance. Did I understand that correctly? No, no. What we talked about in the meeting, and I think there were some of the notes talked about, um, is anybody that signs up for one of these TNCs or wants to be a driver for one of the TNCs, they have to get a letter from their insurance company um, denoting the fact that they're using their personal car for commercial activity. That's, that's what I thought you meant, the, oh, okay. to reflect the commercial, okay, the commercial use, I should say. Correct. Okay. And then you offered uh, comments related to the strict enforcement and our ability to provide enforcement is limited based on what you uh, have um, considered being a 17% increase in vehicles on the street for hire. Is that correct? I, I wasn't necessarily connecting the two. Okay. I, I was just saying that, you know, we, we've got hard-working uh, enforcement officers out there, and when they do see something, a, a violation, um, there's no teeth to the um, penalties. Uh, they're not significant enough to deter the multiple folks that right now are operating illegally. Okay, I think I have everything. Thank you, Mr. Case, for sharing your comments. Thank you. I believe that concludes uh, all components of tonight's hearing. I want to share with our audience, our audience in chambers this evening and our viewing audience that we will take all of the feedback, not only from yesterday's Vehicle for Hire Board, but what we've heard this evening and moving forward with the proposed and necessary changes related to the Vehicle for Hire Board. I want to take yet another opportunity to share with everyone that the changes are related to the safety, consumer protection of our great citizens. We have a great city, and our city is great because of a lot of folks who put their hard work into working, living, and supporting the city, and we don't take that lightly. We do understand, though, in moving a city forward that we have to make changes so that we all can continue to thrive and grow. Our visitor uh, revenue is extremely important to a lot of the safety net services and the other services of the city that we must ensure so that we can take care of all of our citizens. Again, this has been a long journey, uh, starting off with a uh, meeting with the mayor and all of the folks in administration, safety department and licensing section to look at how do we increase the ability of our taxi cabs and all of our vehicle for higher opportunities to thrive in our city. And that requires change. And change is certainly something that is constant. We've looked and committed to insurance changes that we talked about a year ago and are still considering the changes related to that. Again, the protection of our citizens is absolutely a priority of mine. I want to make sure that everyone is aware that the choices that our citizens make and how they choose to get around our great city comes with some responsibility. I encourage them to educate themselves 
on the decisions and want to make sure they have correct information. If you have any questions related to transportation, how it's regulated, please feel free to contact the license section or the public safety department or my office. Again, making choices requires some education. I want to make sure that our consumers are well educated about the decisions that they make when it comes to modes of transportation. We do have regulations that have made painstakingly changes to the taxi cab industry particularly and that our taxi cab drivers have cooperated with. And with that, we have wanted to make sure that along that time our community is educated, educated about why the changes and the changes that we've made and that those changes are on behalf of their safety. So we do have a regulated vehicle for hire. We don't have folks that are just operating without any regulations. So I want to make sure that um, when comments are made about the taxi cab industry that it's fairly represented in terms of what they offer. With that, um, that will be the conclusion of tonight's hearing. I thank you all for coming to tonight's hearing and those who are listening to this hearing this evening in their home. Be safe in traveling home and please have an opportunity to enjoy this brief great weather that we have. Thank you.